Welcome to Tea is Good, Books Are Better, podcast where we drink tea, talk about books. I'm Jess. And I'm Raven. Woohoo! Woohoo! <laughs> I did it! I didn't have to say the intro for once. <laughs> I'm surprised I knew it. <laughs> yeah, you actually nailed it. Woohoo! It turns out it is back there. It is uh, deep in the recesses of your mind. Yep. It's in my brain. <laughs> Just lurking, waiting to be spoken. <laughs> Apparently. <laughs> today i am actually drinking a cold brew coffee the from, fuck i bought a container of starbucks cold brews and i've been chugging that all weekend like from the grocery it's store it. yeah it's like black coffee yeah. but like in like jugs it's freaking delicious jake bought some iced coffee in that form uh, yeah. During the heat wave, because he still needed his coffee, but he was like dying. Yeah, because it's freaking hot. So everything was so hot, so we didn't want to drink hot coffee. I like it because there's nothing in it, so I can do whatever I want to it. Because I find like their little bottled Starbucks drinks are just so full of sugar, I just cannot drink it. So bad. Mm. See, I actually like the little, uh, the ones in oh. the glass bottles, because I can drink that one without having to lie down for the rest of the day. Because coffee fucks you up? Yeah. <laughs> and I don't know why those ones are fine, but apparently they are. Maybe it's not that much coffee in them or something. I don't know. <laughs> I bet it's mostly cream. Yeah. <laughs> uh, although these days, that can also put me on my ass, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Welcome to adulthood. I hate it. <laughs> right? I went why to the dentist today. <laughs> oh, shit. By myself. <laughs> <laughs> the horror <laughs> welcome to being an adult forcing yourself to make a dentist appointment and then go without canceling <laughs> yeah <laughs> we gotta suck it up yeah. anyway I'm drinking a vanilla cream ooh mm-hmm. and it's not the decaf one it's, it's another one it's one of the new ones I bought from that tea place in New West. Mm. Well, Fancy. Jake bought it. But... <laughs> <laughs> Tastes good. Very Tastes nice. like vanilla. Very nice. So we're starting this one off yeah. with Tyrion. And I guess Salsa. Okay, where did we leave them last time? Tyrion learns of the Red Wedding and plots with his father and how to deal with Oberyn Martell. And... Uh... <laughs> What? Sansa is married to Tyrion and she is miserable. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Epic. Yeah. <laughs> Chapter 58 <clears throat> is Tyrion. Tyrion is quietly getting dressed while Sansa sleeps. He thinks about how she didn't react when he told her about her mother and brother's death. And then eventually hearing her sobbing behind closed doors later on. Okay, I fucking called it that we would not see her being told. Yeah. I called it. Fucking know how George <laughs> writes now. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't know him. Yeah. He had considered going to her to offer comfort before, before remembering that it was his family who did this. So she's not going to want his comfort. Uh, it was his family? It was kind of the phrase. But Ty, T T Tywin? Yeah, Tywin was behind it, though. Does everyone know that? Tyrion knows that. But would Sansa know that? Or does Tyrion just feel that guilty Sansa will himself? blame everything on Lannisters. Well, I guess. Yeah, if Joffrey wasn't such a fucking dick, then... In Cersei. Yeah. Like, she also blames a lot on Cersei. True. He instead chooses not to share the gorier details of what happened to their bodies. Rob had been hacked and mutilated, and her mother had been dumped naked into the Green Fork as a mockery of the Tully funerals. 
Jesus Christ. <laughs> I was very sad to read that. Like, ugh. Spent all this time getting to know them, and then, ugh, this is what happens. It's almost as if he wasn't anybody. He's just mm-hmm. some random person that we're hearing about now. But it was like, n- no, this was Rob Stark. And now we're just hearing about him being mutilated like it's no big deal. Yeah. It's kind of... Yeah. It's it's shocking, for it sure. It be real sad. And I, it like makes me wonder how, how it feels to write something like that. True. Anyway, maybe we'll talk more about that later. Because I feel like it goes kind of deeper into it in maybe one yeah. of the later chapters. Tyrion and Sansa had been given the spacious apartments above the kitchen keep that had enough rooms, the house pod, and Sansa's servants. Somehow, Varys had managed to get Shay as one of Sansa's servants, and the other is Brella, who Varys had suggested to him. Um, she was one of Renly's servants and knew how to keep secrets. Mm. Yeah, she didn't let out any of Renly's lovers. Oh, uh, like Sex she didn't. Sneak. She didn't. She didn't. She didn't rat out Renly. Yeah. Tyrion sneaks out and he heads down to the cellars where the dragon skulls are, where Shay is waiting for him. Shay's in a playful mood, blows out the candles, and makes Tyrion catch her in the darkness. Well, she lets him catch her in the darkness. <laughs> because he, he couldn't really do shit. Yeah. And then they do the horizontal tango. <laughs> Afterwards, Tyrion says that they should get dressed, as it's almost daytime, and Sansa will be waking up soon. She begins to massage his shoulders, and asks what's stressing him, so <laughs> he's, he's like... Let me see, uh, my wife, my sister, my nephew, my father, the Tyrells, the Varys, Pycelle, Littlefinger, the Red Viper, my face. And Shay assures him that she, she loves his face. And while Tyrion appreciates this, there is a very logical voice in his head yelling at him that she's a whore and she's paid to love him. As they feel around for their clothes and get dressed, Tyrion feels sick with remorse and anxiety. He understands the great risk he's putting Shay in by sneaking around with her, and he thinks about getting rid of her. He thinks about giving her to Chitaya, where she can have all the silks and gems she could want, and gentle highborn men, rather than the, I guess, the men she's used to after following armies. Mm -hmm. Or maybe that he can even wed her to someone. He thinks about how he's seen this guy called Sir Talit eyeballing her. Is that just some rando, like, guard? Like, I guess. Mm. It's some rando knight. I don't remember Sir Talit. Yeah, I haven't heard that name. And he is also gathering the strength to sit through Joffrey's wedding that day. Jay tells him that she will go first to help Rella with the bath water and tells Tyrion she loves him before heading up. He thinks about how he loved her and then he also thinks again about how Sir Talad would make a good match for her. And that is that chapter. Does he decide at the end there that he's going to? It's like at the end he's like, she, he's like thinking like she's this guy's a good match for her. I should bet them. Okay, but he hadn't yet decided to. No, it was more like a thought. Like I, I should do this. I should do this. Okay. Well, not mm-hmm. a whole lot going on in this chapter. It's just kind of like lead up to the wedding it is it's like uh Tyrion's feelings yeah it's basically anxiety and that stuff yeah getting stuck with his addiction which is horse uh, yeah she Oars. specifically she's I think. <laughs> she's love she's really good at her job it is sad when you think about how Tyrion would definitely be willing to put Shay aside if like he had a wife who loved him. Yeah, definitely. But alas, nope. His wife hates him for good reason. Yeah, I guess. Like he he gets it. He understands it. I, it's not personal though. I don't think Sansa mm-hmm. just hates Lannisters. <laughs> yeah, I, I think he knows that. Too. Yeah, he totally gets it. But it doesn't make it hurt less. I think. True. He's very hurt by Sansa. Yeah. Well, he's just hurt by... It's not because... Like, it's he's not in love with Sansa. He's just, like, 
hurt by the idea of his wife not loving him and he's like yeah stuck that way he does forever. like that yeah yep i mean he's stuck in a loveless marriage no one wants that at least sansa got the good one <laughs> the the one good one <laughs> you mean out of the lannisters <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah i guess they could have like wed her to lancel lancel ew <laughs> <laughs> he's such a little worm he is <laughs> and then we also learn that Sansa knows about her family's deaths now so mm-hmm. a little skipperoo there and I'm... it's Jock's wedding that day yeah I wonder if George had written that scene and then just cut it later of her finding out or if he just like didn't write it at all I think he just preferred telling it from Tyrion's point of view, possibly, instead of writing about how old is she? Thirteen. Well, yeah. I mean, about that's ultimately what he went for. Thirteen-year-old girl's view. But it still could have been from Tyrion's perspective. I'm just, I'm wondering if, like, in his first draft, he mm. wrote it, or if he just like decided right from the beginning that he was going to skip it. Possibly, he could have written it. I didn't mind how. Tyrion viewed how she was able to keep her face so cold the entire time. Yeah. I thought that would would have more of an impact from his point of view of how good she's gotten at hiding her emotions. I imagine she just like dissociated. Yeah. Like how can you possibly hear that news and not react without just disengaging from everything around you. That'd be extraordinary. Yeah. Shay is one of Sansa's maids. I guess this is the first time we're finding out about that, right? Oh, yeah. At first, I thought, like, I was wondering if the show just did that because it was easier to keep her around instead of adding, like, a whole new characters. Yeah. For her to be servants of, so I thought that was pretty interesting that Shay actually did end up being one of Sansa's maids. Indeed, just a lot later than in the show. <laughs> yeah, Tyrion really lucked out <laughs> by having her so close. Yeah, having Varys managing to pull her from the other family and gave her to what's his face, Tyrion. <laughs> well, I was on the impression that the yeah. other family really liked her a lot too. Yes, but I imagine if like. The king's aunt needs a handmaid. <laughs> She's the one who's gonna get it, you know. The Lannister called for her. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. But they have no say. There's also I remember getting a a sense of foreboding with Tyrion's feelings of danger with keeping Shay around. Yeah, like that feels what? like it's leading up to something. Is this the first time you started to feel anxiety around her? I don't recall, even though he's my chapters. No, he's definitely, like, he's been worried about being mm-hmm. caught with her before, but I think it's kind of just getting to a point where it's like, I'm starting to feel that same sense of worry that he does, mm-hmm. I guess. Yeah, it's all, and it, I think it's the first time we started thinking about getting, like, actively getting rid of her. Finding a new home for her. Yeah, I guess so. Like, he's becoming more serious about his thoughts about getting rid of her, I think. Mm-hmm. Especially now that, like, things are getting so insane. Like, the Starks have been wiped out, and the King's about to be married, and it's just, like, a lot yeah. of a lot of crazy shit going on around them. Probably after the Battle of Blackwater also helped. Mm-hmm. Like, really stress them out. The realities of war. Yeah. Alright. Chapter 59 is Sansa. Sansa wakes up in bed and thinks about how alone she is in the world now. And this is kind of the only introspection that we really get from her. I feel Mm -hmm. like. I think I'm more used to how grief is written in YA novels. Mm -hmm. And this approach... To grief kind of leaves it more up to the reader to kind of figure out for yourself how she's feeling. Mm. 
based on like her actions and her dialogue instead of a lot of like inner monologue yeah it's a more advanced way of way of writing i would say (laughs) (laughs) definitely for older people (laughs) (laughs) for adults for adults uh Tyrion is not there he's a bad sleeper so Sansa gets up and her new maids bring in hot water for her bath her old maids were replaced by Tyrion who said they were Cersei's spies one of the new maids is Shay, who sometimes gives Sansa insolent looks interesting insolent you mean insolent yeah uh it's just kind of like rude or like oh snooty Okay. We're like disobedient. I noticed also, I don't know if we talked about this, but in the show, Shay was really unhappy with Tyrion's marriage, but in the book, she seems pretty chill. Like, she's like, yeah, yeah, it's fine. I'll just be your whore on his side. The insolent looks is what makes me question that, though. Yeah. <laughs> now I'm like, huh. Yeah. Because, okay. like, she acts all, like, whatever to Tyrion. Mm hmm. But, uh,. I guess because Sansa is, I mean, if we're thinking, this could be one of two different things. I mean, there's more possibilities, but I think most likely it's one of two different things. Shay either does care about Tyrion and is in love with him and is jealous of Sansa being his wife. Or uh, she sees Sansa as a threat to her payday. (laughs) Because if Sansa starts to care about Tyrion and they start acting like an actual husband and wife, then Shay is going to be out of the picture. Yep. I think most likely it's one of those two things, but it could be, I mean, it could be a thousand different things. I wonder if it's probably a concern for her payday. Because he's giving her a ton of money. Mm Mm-hmm. And, like, if he were to want his wife over her, who is apparently both younger and more beautiful, and definitely high boy, why would he keep paying her? Exactly. This huge amount that he usually does. So I think it's probably she's in the way of my money. But, I mean, maybe not right now, because Tyrion's yeah. still paying Shay, but she could... Like, Sansa could snap her fingers and easily things would be over for Shay. (laughs) Um, That's what I'm thinking. Another thing I was thinking is that every day that Shay spends in the castle is a risk to Tyrion. Mm -hmm. Because if anyone knew anything about their relationship and told the wrong person, Tyrion would be in huge trouble and whatever. Shay would be killed probably. So, if Tyrion and Sansa started being a real husband and wife, Shay would probably also be removed from the castle. So that risk is not there anymore. Like, why would he keep her around? Yeah. At all. Exactly. So not only would she lose her paycheck, she would also lose her her new comfortable living situation. Yeah, her home, all of her jewels, all of her silk. Yeah. No longer boiled. (laughs) And I mean, like, Tyrion knows about Chataya and that there are other options that are, like, decent. But, Mm. like, I don't think that Shay wants anything less than what she has right now. (laughs) Still for less. Exactly. So, Sansa climbs into the tub, nervous about the wedding at midday. But first comes breakfast in the Queen's ballroom. She will be breaking her fast with the Lannisters and the Tyrell men. And she's kind of bitter that she's considered a Lannister now and she's not able to go and uh, eat with Marjorie and the women. It's unfortunate. Tyrion and Podrick Payne arrive as she's being dressed. Tyrion immediately starts drinking. Sansa asks him if he's going to change into his handsome new doublet. And he seems rather bitter at that comment, saying he'll go change into the thing that is handsome and make himself look less dwarfish. Whew. Which I thought was interesting, like, uh, whoa. <laughs> He's had a rough night. He's not bad. <laughs> yeah, damn. He Chill, and... bro. 
Like, all she did was ask if you're going to be dressing in the handsome new doublet. <laughs> she is talking to you. <laughs> he and Pod change, and Sansa thinks about how she was wary of Pod at first, since he's the cousin to Sir Ill and Payne. But she mm. soon came to realize he was as timid and as frightened of her as she was of his cousin. <laughs> totally forgot that was a thing. Yeah. <laughs> They're related. Yeah, like Podrick Payne. Wow, didn't put that together. <laughs> You'll get there. Uh, straight A's in high school, folks. That was a long <laughs> time ago. <laughs> <laughs> when everyone is ready to go, Sansa starts to come up with excuses to get out of it, but ultimately decides she must be brave like Rob and takes her lord husband by the arm. Breakfast is hearty with lots of musical entertainment. And people start presenting Joffrey with gifts. Cersei gives him the wife's cloak he will drape over Marjorie's shoulders during the wedding ceremony later, saying that it was the one she donned when Robert took her for his queen. Others give him a bow, riding boots, a jousting saddle, etc., all very magnificent and extravagant. Lord Paxter Redwin gives him a model of a ship currently being built for him on the arbor. It's going to be called King Joffrey's Valor. Okay. <laughs> what does valor mean? <laughs> uh, like courage, bravery, heroism. Nice, nice. Sounds just like King Joffrey. <laughs> right? <laughs> Tyrion then presents him with a huge old book called Lives of Four Kings. Joffrey seems offended, and Tyrion explains it's about basically the history of the monarchy of Westeros. And even Sir Kevin says it's a book that every king should read. Joffrey snaps that if Tyrion read less, perhaps Sansa would have a baby in her belly by now. He laughs and tells Sansa that once he's gotten his queen with child, he will visit her bedchamber and show his little uncle how it's done. Gross? Very gross. Is there a character ever who has been more vile than Joffrey Baratheon? I ask you this seriously. Mm. So far, I think he is pretty nasty. <laughs> Because there's, like, there's, there are characters out there who have done worse things, obviously. Mm hmm But I feel like, ah, I don't know, something about Joffrey, he just feels so real. Like, he feels like he could be yeah. a real-ass person. There's a cruelty to him that, ugh, ugh, like, it really bothers, like, not just me, like, lots of people. Everyone hates Joffrey. But, like... <laughs> But, like, that cruelty is, it's not so extreme that you're, like, <laughs> this is, like, a fictional villain, like, Voldemort. Like, it's, like, so realistic, I think. Like, like umbrage level cruelty. Like, yes. this is someone, like, this is someone, like, some people have seen. That is a good comparison. Because I was just thinking that there's, like, there's a ton of of fictional villains but often there are people who like the villain and yeah. i'm one of those people like i'm often like on the dark side often the villain is like my favorite character like yeah darth vader all the way <laughs> <laughs> Don't you like kylo oh i love <laughs> kylo ren but he's like kind of a is he dark is he light he's kind of a twin but joffrey no one in the entire world likes Joffrey. <laughs> no. Everyone ever hates Joffrey. <laughs> yeah, it's a cruelty to him that's like, you can't even relate to that. And that's why I think the comparison to Umbridge is such a good one, because everyone hates Umbridge too. Not a single person that I've ever met has liked Umbridge. <laughs> no. But like people like wild character. people like Snape and people like Voldemort. They do. I wonder why it is. So ah yeah, like is it just the cruelty that like, people aren't into that? I think like, it's... they don't mind evil, but like when it comes to just pure malice and cruelty, and then it's like, it's like whoa. It I makes no. It makes me think of what Tyrion said in the most recent mini episode that we did with Eric there was a line in the show it was season 2 episode 6 that we watched I think there was a line where Tyrion says we've had idiots for kings and we've had 
or we've had idiot kings and we've had vicious kings, but I don't think we've ever been cursed with an idiot vicious king before Joffrey. Uh. So it's, uh, maybe it's not just the cruelty, maybe it's the mix of the cruelty with the pure idiocy. Like, he's like, <laughs> he doesn't impulsive. make, he's impulsive, he makes terrible choices, nothing he does is for anyone other than himself. Yep. And maybe that's part of the cruelty, but it's also like, running a kingdom, it's also stupid. <laughs> <laughs> it is very much. I think it's horrifying that he has been given this power, this nasty little boy. And uh, you know what? There definitely has probably been people out there like just like that, given this kind of power, like oh, yeah. small, like, young, impulsive, stupid, and cruel, all mixed together. Mm-hmm. Maybe just because like it's very real compared to. Like, the big baddies that people seem to like. Right. People like Darth Vader. Like, he's... Yeah, he is cruel. But he's... He's smart. He does things for the Empire. And he's powerful. In a way that's cool. Joffrey is not powerful on his own. He's pathetic. Yeah. And he has everyone else do his dirty work. And then he takes all the credit. Exactly. It's just so gross. <laughs> What's that ship's name? Joffrey's Valor. <laughs> King Joffrey's Valor. <laughs> okay. Uh. Hello, this is Editing Raven here. I just wanted to add something real quick that I think we were trying to say but didn't quite land on. The comparison between Umbridge and Joffrey I think is important because a lot of their actions in their stories are more small scale than uh, characters like Darth Vader or like Voldemort who are trying to rule the world or rule empires. Joffrey may be trying to run a kingdom, but a lot of his actions are a lot more small scale. We see them from a very personal perspective and we see like the small cruel things that he does. Uh, And it's the same way with Umbridge. She may be part of the Ministry of Magic, but uh, when we're seeing her cruelty, we're seeing it on a, on a much smaller, more personal scale. Like when she makes Harry write out the lines and carve his own name into his flesh. And when she makes a first year student do that. And when something is on a much smaller scale like that, I think we as readers feel it a lot more because it's much closer to us and it feels more real it feels like it could actually happen and it's kind of harder to think big picture stuff like taking over the world or saving the planet and I think that's why the smaller scale cruel things stand out and make these characters so so insidious and so easy to hate so I think that's something that we were trying to touch on here but we were just kind of bouncing around it Uh, One more thing that I wanted to add is that Joffrey has no redeemable qualities. And I think that's something else that I was uh, trying to say. Joffrey has no redeemable qualities. Whereas characters like Darth Vader, he kind of had a redemption arc at the end. And was also just very cool and intimidating and scary. And someone like Thanos... He actually had a fascinating motive, one that maybe wasn't wrong necessarily. Maybe the way he went about it was wrong, but the motive itself was not. And those are both things that I think could be considered redeemable qualities. But Joffrey doesn't really have anything quite like that. At least not that Jessica or I could think of. And that's it. Editing Raven out. All right, uh, where was I? Sure. Oh, I guess that also makes me think what... How does George feel about Joffrey? <laughs> like, obviously, he's a vile character, but I feel like every character is, like, kind of a little bit like your child. 
I mean, I would be very proud to create a character such as Joffrey. Yeah. Like, one he's so hated, everyone is repulsed by. Like, create a character that inspires so much emotion in other people. Like, that's impressive. Impressive as fuck. It is. But it also makes me wonder that, like, does George have any compassion in his heart for Joffrey? <laughs> like, does he think even the, t- like, is Joffrey even the tiniest bit, like, misunderstood? <laughs> Derek has, if he had to write for Cersei's point of view, like, I think he could write about Joffrey compassionately. Mm-hmm. I was just remembering Jamie's chapter, <laughs> what to call him in, but... <laughs> He didn't much care for the kid. Uh, that comes later. <laughs> yep. <Yeah. laughs> uh, I was going to use him as a reference. I was like, oh. But I'm not even <laughs> thinking about, like, George writing from the perspective of another one of the characters. Mm. I just mean George himself. Like, would he at all defend Joffrey or any of his actions? Or would he just be like, oh, no, Joffrey's terrible? <laughs> I don't think he'd ever defend Joffrey or his actions. But he does think explain a little bit about why he's this way a little bit where i think later on maybe oh like you get bits and you get tidbits of joffrey as a child and like how robert was with him you get little (laughs) bits and pieces of like why he seems so desperate for like attention and that sort of stuff ah okay not that I'm sympathizing with him. He's a little shit. <laughs> yeah, there can be reasons as long as they're not excuses. Yeah. But one could also argue, what what's the difference? <laughs> <laughs> All exactly. right. <laughs> Sansa is afraid of what Tyrion might say after Joffrey makes that gross comment about how he's going to visit her bed chamber. But Tyrion just takes a huge swig of wine and doesn't say anything. <laughs> Doing very well. Self control. <laughs> I was uh, applauding his coolness. His restraint. Yeah. Lord Mace Tyrell presents his gift a huge golden chalice with the sigils of each great house on it. Joffrey says they'll need to chip off the wolf and put a squid in its place, which Sansa pretends not to hear. He just hates her. <laughs> For yeah, some... he, just, he just wants to hurt. It's like a her. weird obsessive thing with him. Like. Gross, She's a play thing for him. He just wants to torment her. Yeah. Lastly, Lord Tywin presents his gift. A longsword whose steel is rippled with black and red. Ooh. Ooh. Many of the men make compliments, and Joffrey is so excited he starts slashing at the air. He asks what he shall call it, which makes Sansa remember Lion's Tooth, <laughs> the sword Arya had flung into the trident, and Heart Eater, the one he'd made her kiss before the battle. Gross. <laughs> yeah, the gifts... two failed swords already. What happened to Heart Eater? Did something happen to that one? Or right? Well, Maybe it's not Valyrian steel, so it's shit. Yeah, he might still have it, but yeah, whatever. <laughs> the guests start shouting out names, and Joffrey decides on Widow's Wail, saying he shall make many a widow. Okay, dude. Uh huh. Has he killed anyone at all in battle ever? I don't think so (laughs) he continues to swing the sword about until someone warns him to take care Valerian steel is very sharp Joffrey says he knows and then brings the sword down onto the book Tyrion gave him he hacks the book into pieces and Sansa can see Tyrion struggling with his fury one of the Tyrell men even mentions that there are only four copies of that book that were written in Kaeth's own hand I guess that's whoever wrote the book. And Joff just says, now there are three. Big oof. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Writing out books was a whole ordeal back in the day. They had to be handwritten. Yeah, it's by hand. All of them. Can you imagine writing out your own book four times? No, that sounds horrendous, especially it- if it's like dictionary thick. It's a massive book, too. It says Probably like that. a lifetime. A lifetime to do that. Yeah. Well, I guess they have, like, nothing better to do. <laughs> <laughs> nothing to do get distracted by his cell phone. <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, but now, uh, now that one has been hacked to pieces. And 
Chop. Disrespectful. Oh, that's for sure. Not only was it rare, but it's like, come on, man. That was a but, gift, too. Right? Joffrey turns to Tyrion and says, Tyrion and Sansa owe him a new present. This one is all chopped to pieces. Douche. <sighs> Douche. <laughs> <laughs> Tyrion suggests a dagger to match his sword. Perhaps one that is also Valyrian steel with a dragon bone hilt. Joffrey seems taken aback. He says a dagger would be acceptable, but dragon bone is too plain. So, did you realize what Tyrion is doing here? Yeah. Yeah. I'll take that as a no. <laughs> <laughs> no. I think it mentions it in his next chapter, but I also had no idea what Tyrion was doing until later, but but that'll have to be in the next chapter, so I don't want to give anything away. <laughs> okay. But just take note of what Tyrion said here. He suggested a dagger of Valyrian steel with a dragon bone hilt. Oh, oh. <laughs> I, did, I did catch that when I read it, but I didn't really pay attention. It's like, what's he trying to say? Okay. Yeah, I was just like, oh, it's on. very, uh, did he already, like, I was like, why is he being so specific? Is he already having one being made or something? Like, why? Mm -hmm. <laughs> anyway. Afterwards, as Tyrion and Sansa are crossing the yard, Prince Oberyn of Dorne approaches, and Sansa looks curiously at the woman he's with. Shay had told her Alaria worships some Lysene love goddess and was also a whore when the prince found her. A whore? A whore? Or was like almost a whore? One of those. <laughs> prince Oberyn says he thinks Caeth was too kind to King Viserys in that book. Tyrion disagrees, thinking Viserys was shamed very obviously in the book. Apparently this King Viserys... I'm not sure which King Viserys it was. I think there have been three, right? No idea. Anyway, this is maybe the first one because they don't give him like a King Viserys the second. They just call him King Viserys. Anyway, apparently this King Viserys poisoned his own nephew to gain the throne and then did nothing once he had it. Jesus. According to Tyrion, Baylor starved himself fasting, not because he was poisoned. So, Baylor the Blessed was King Viserys' nephew? Huh. Okay. <laughs> but Tyrion doesn't blame Viserys if he did poison him. He says someone had to save the realm from Baylor's follies. Sansa is shocked. She says he was a great king, and when he rescued the dragon knight from a snake pit, the vipers refused to strike because he was so pure and holy. Elaria. Sorry, what? <laughs> what? <laughs> I snickered and I'm like, oh, I'm sorry, yes. Oh. <laughs> Ilaria corrects her, saying he was bitten half a hundred times and he should have died. Tyrion says some believe he was deranged by all the venom. Probably was. Yeah. But this is all, like, very... Like, what the hell are they talking about? <laughs> You're right? I'm like, huh. <laughs> Trying to keep up with the names. I'm like, uh... It just Are we feel... talking about it again? Yeah, it feels like something that might like come up again later or something, which is why I'm including it. Mm -hmm. Oberyn then compares Viserys to Joffrey and asks how they explain Joffrey's behavior. Tyrion says they prefer not to, and then climbs into his litter with Sansa. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. I like how Oberyn sits with Joffrey for like one breakfast, and he's like, "What the fuck is wrong with this guy?" <laughs> <laughs> he just picks up on it and you stop he's like whoa yeah like who put this cycle? fucking toddler on the throne <laughs> right. they sit for a while in the litter and Sansa makes herself say she's sorry about Tyrion's book but Tyrion bitterly says it was Joffrey's book and he may have learned a thing or two from it but he should have known better when Sansa says he might be happier with the dagger, Tyrion asks if Joffrey ever quarreled with Rob or Bran at Winterfell. Sansa's like, what the fuck? <laughs> Why are you asking me this? But she just says everyone loved Bran and she doesn't remember them ever interacting. Tyrion then asks if she knows what happened to Bran at Winterfell. She says he fell and Theon Greyjoy later killed him. Tyrion says Sansa's lady mother once accused him of something. He will not burden her with the details, but he was accused falsely. He says he never harmed Bran and he means no harm to her. 
Sansa has no fucking idea what he's talking about. <laughs> and she does not know what he wants from her, but she can clearly see that he's... He does want something. Like, he wants her to say something. Mm -hmm. But she's like, I don't... What the fuck are you talking about? <laughs> she has no idea. He says... She's never asked him how Rob died, or her lady mother, but Sansa says she doesn't want to know. He says yeah. he will say no more then, and Sansa says that's kind of him. And Tyrion is like, yes, I'm the very soul of kindness. <laughs> he pats himself in the back. Uh, I'm a good person, my lady wife said so. I think he's being sarcastic. <laughs> <laughs> so lots of interesting stuff about Bran happening between the lines here. Mucho subtext. I definitely was with Sansa the first time I read it. It wasn't until I was summarizing that I was like, uh, I, see what's ha I see what's happening here. Oh, yeah. Yeah. But again, I don't want to give it away, so we'll kind of have to wait till the next chapter, but we can't really do that in this episode. Because <laughs> it's a big one. It is a big one. Took me a long time to write it all out. Yeah. Well, I guess we can say this much. Tyrion um, is obviously bringing up the time he was accused. Accused? Wow. He accused. was accused. <laughs> he was accused by Catelyn of trying to murder Bran in his bed. Yeah. I guess I still don't understand everything that's, that Tyrion's trying to do here. Yeah, when I didn't get it either. <laughs> when he's talking to Sansa. Uh-huh. But, like, I knew what he was talking about, but I didn't get what he was trying to get at. Right. Like, Sansa does not know that someone tried to kill Bran in his bed, right? I think so. All she knew was that he fell. Yeah, so that's, so that's why Tyrion is asking if she knows what happened to him. Uh-huh. And she just says, oh, he fell, and then Theon tried to kill him. Or did kill him. And so that's when oh, yeah. Tyrion learns that she, okay, she for sure doesn't know that someone yeah. tried to kill Bran in his bed. So yeah. he decides to bring up that he was accused of something, even though he's not going to tell her what it was. I guess so. And then tell her he never hurt Bran and he means no harm to her? <laughs> like, that's just... <sighs> he's just, like, really wants her. To like him, I guess, or at least treat him. But then, why bring it up Tiny at all? Bit of warmth. It's just so weird. Like, oh, I'm not a bad person. I didn't hurt your brother. And she's just like, huh? Because he was waiting for something from her. Mm -hmm. But like, what is she supposed to say to that? She doesn't know. Maybe he just feels guilty about something. Possibly. Or maybe he's worried that she's gonna find out in the future. And so he wants to kind of lay it out now that he never tried to do any of that shit. I don't know. It is confusing. <laughs> His feelings are complex. <laughs> Maybe we'll figure it out in the next chapter. But anyway, that's going to be it for A Storm of Swords for this one. Ooh. I guess we can do some quick catching up. We have a few minutes left. Cool, cool, cool. I went to. Hey, did you? Oh, sorry. You go first. <laughs> it's just because I was going. Cook, 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 cook. <laughs> did you watch the last season of that show? Oh, Brooklyn Nine Nine. Yeah. I am. I'm like seven episodes in or something. I, I don't remember how many. Johnny and I just blasted through them. Oh, you guys watched the whole thing? Yep. Well, we're done with. <laughs> nice. I had no idea it was the last season until the last episode. I'm like, oh. Okay. <laughs> uh, well, don't spoil anything. <laughs> I will. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, it started off interesting. Started off with a COVID episode, but then yeah. that was like the only time COVID ever comes up. <laughs> <laughs> right? I'm like, oh, so COVID exists in this world? Yeah. I heard that um, Superstore covered COVID in one of their seasons, but it's like the seasons that are not on Netflix. <laughs> oh. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but I heard, like, they did a really amazing job at kind of capturing how it is from a retail perspective. And that's why I'm, like, 
I really want to watch this season because obviously I was in that position. Mm -hmm. I was working through COVID in retail, like at the height of the pandemic. Yeah, you did. Uh, so I'm really curious to see how they covered that, but I don't know. I'd have to like pirate it. I just like, <laughs> just wait. I'm lazy. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I could just see if it ends yeah. up on Netflix. They also deal a little bit with police brutality. But they, they, they bring it in for a few a few uh, episodes. In Brooklyn Nine-Nine? Yeah. Yeah. They're actually... Um, interesting. They are pretty good about covering some very real topics. Like, uh, there have been previous episodes in previous seasons where sexism in the workplace, they kind of cover that stuff. And it's all kind of from... Jake's perspective and he's like learning um, especially about his own like participation and those kinds of things I don't know what I would call it <laughs> and then yeah and this one is kind of the same thing they like actually talk about George Floyd and there's like consequences within the precinct and it's interesting I don't know how I feel about it first I thought it was kind of like off putting but I did like it uh, they got more into it. Now they speak it. Okay. Because, like, I don't think it would have been appropriate for the show to ignore it. Yeah. And make a whole season without talking about it. So I do think that they, them doing it was the right call. Definitely. And, uh, I th it was tasteful. Like, I think that they, yeah. they learned a lot, I guess. But also, like, I'd be curious to hear how someone who is more affected by racial profiling and that sort of thing would be yeah would think about the show covering True. it and how how they did it oh. i went to a burlesque show on the weekend <laughs> your your <laughs> your ooh got cut off <laughs> <laughs> yeah it sounds like ooh. Yeah, I was at the Rio in Vancouver, and yeah. one of Jake's friend's girlfriend was in it, so that's kind of why we were there. Cool. It actually looks so fun. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Yeah, like, if I had any balls or time, I would probably try it. It looked fun. Is it just dancing? Yeah, it's basically just dancing and taking your clothes off. <laughs> They, like, get down to their tiny thongs and pasties. And that's as far as they'll go. Awesome. Yeah, it's really fun. Yeah, I think I'm really saying that, that that's something I was interested in, in the going to with Johnny. But he kind of, like, really uncomfortable with the idea. Oh. I did kind of notice that, like, maybe this is just me, like, overthinking things. But Jake wouldn't really react unless I reacted first like he wouldn't clap unless I was clapping and cheering Ah, <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know if he was just like you know because people like will often only clap if they hear someone else clapping first true like no one wants to be the first clapper so I don't know if no. it was more like a, that sort of thing like he wasn't like he just wasn't thinking about it or if he was, like, actually trying to be mindful and, like, not be cheering for naked women when I'm right next to him. <laughs> That's cute. <laughs> I mean, I don't know which one yeah. it was, but it was just I an think... interesting thing that I noticed. Yeah, it's the same with uh, Johnny. Like, the whole idea doing that with uh, his girl, when he has a girl, <laughs> it makes him really uncomfortable. Mm. You can still go and, you know, appreciate. There's very, there's a ton of different types of bodies, too. Like, I think it's a great way to celebrate all different kinds of bodies and types of femmes out there, you know? Pretty cool. There was, like, a woman in her late 40s. Wow. There were, like, people who were, like, 90 pounds. There were people who were, like, 300 pounds. But, like, whatever. They all looked amazing. And it was just a great way to celebrate all sorts of bodies and shapes and... I think Johnny should go, is what I'm trying to say. 
<laughs> that sounds awesome. I think he just needs to maybe shift his perspective on what it is. Mm-hmm. Like, it's about empowerment and it's about celebrating different types of bodies, I would say, from my experience there. Yeah. But maybe he's, like, kind of interpreting it more as, like, a sexual <laughs> yeah, it's experience. Thinking. So, yeah. It is for him. So maybe uh, just needs to shift his, his ideas on it a little bit. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> anyway, I guess that's good. That's about an hour. Um, Thank you so much for listening. If you want more of the podcast, please follow us on Instagram. You can follow the podcast at Tigbab Podcast, or you can follow us separately. My handle is Crimby, just as is just.egan24. You can also find us on Facebook. Just search Tigbab Podcast or Tea is Good, Books Are Better, and we should show up there. Also, please subscribe to our good friend Baram Barami on YouTube. He's the one who made our jingle, which you heard at the start of this episode. And he's a really cool guy and makes dope stuff, so check him out. And you can also join our Patreon, patreon.com slash better. We have a few different tea-themed tiers with fun rewards, such as behind-the-scenes content, outtakes, and mini-episodes in which we force our brother to watch Game of Thrones, which he hates. So you will be getting something in return for your contribution, and you'd also be helping us improve the podcast with better equipment. But we also just appreciate you listening. And please don't forget to share the podcast with your family and your friends. It is the best way for us to grow. Join us next time for the Purple Wedding. Oh, ho, ho. Weddings in one book. I'm Two excited. weddings. Mm-hmm. Will this one be any less bloody than the last one? <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> doubt it. <laughs> Hashtag doubt. <laughs> Thanks for listening. Bye. Bye.